Well, this is the final message in our series called We Build, where Catherine and I, we have been sharing the word for the year, Rebuild. It's been based on the book of Nehemiah, and we've been looking about how God used Nehemiah to help and inspire the people to rebuild after a time of national tragedy, after that period of exile, that period in Israel's history where she was removed from her homeland and taken off to a foreign land. And then how they came back and they started to rebuild and started to restore. Nehemiah is a book about rebuilding. Not only rebuilding the city walls, but also rebuilding the people of God. And we've seen in Nehemiah how the people, they line back up with God's purposes. They regather and they renew their commitment to God, his ways and his word and a spiritual renewal, a revival takes place. Now, it might not have been as it was with Nehemiah's generation, exile. That's not our challenge, but we faced, and we're facing a pandemic. And I don't know about you, but it can seem that a lot has been reduced to rubble and disrepair. And now we face the task of rebuilding. It's as if some of the walls... The walls of our lives came crashing down and the walls even of our church came crashing down and the walls of our city came crashing down and the walls of our nation. But we sense prophetically 2022 that the Lord is saying that now is the time to pick up the bricks, to pick up the bricks of prayer. And we've been sharing about the bricks that we sense that the Lord is asking us to pick up at this time. And prayer being a key one. Because this nation will not get back up on its feet until we, the people of God, get on our knees. But we also were sharing that prayer, we're not going to pray in the way we should unless we first catch hold of God's passion. And right at the very start. We started off with this brick, the brick of passion, catching hold of God's heart, what God feels, stepping into God's burden because that leads us to pray. So we looked at the bricks of passion and prayer in the first session. And then we said in the second session about picking up the brick of participation. You know, Nehemiah, he accomplished something really wonderful, but... He didn't do it alone. Something happened. The Spirit of God moved on the hearts of the people of God. And they, pretty much all of them, they rolled up their sleeves. And together, they were able to do it. So we need to pick up the brick of participation. And then we talked about the brick of public gathering. I love it in Nehemiah. The people, they were scattered doing their own thing. But they came back together And as they came back together, God moved in their midst. This is a vital one in this season. The pandemic has scattered the church in many ways. And and that has led to many positive things as we've gone out and been the church in our community. But there's also a really significant reason why we gather in settings like this. As the word of God is proclaimed and as we come together, it's time to pick up the brick of public gathering. The priority of the words. That was that fifth brick that we looked at in this series. If Nehemiah is a book about revival, then right at the center of that book, of that revival, is this book, the Bible. And picking up the words, rediscovering the word in our rhythms, our devotional rhythms, but also coming around the preaching of the word of God and prioritizing that. That is so so vital. Then in our third session, we talked about the need to pick up the brick of pioneering. You see, Nehemiah, he didn't just have a burden and he didn't simply just pray. He acted on those prayers. We can't just leave it to someone else. We need leaders to stand up, to be the change and pioneer the change that we want to see. It's time to pick up the brick of pioneering. And then perseverance. The need 
to keep on going, to build and battle at the same time. Any vision from God, any task that God has given us, it's going to cause us to have to fight, to keep on fighting and to keep on going, pick up the brick of perseverance. We also looked last week at the need to pick up the brick of pursuit, the pursuit of justice. Nehemiah, he addressed the injustices that were around him. He sought the heart of God, the heart of God for the poor, the weak and the vulnerable. And he pioneered, he strategized, he ushered in the changes that need to be dealt, needed to be seen. And he dealt with the injustices. And so today, we're going to be finishing off our series by looking at the final three bricks in our series. But it's time to pick up the bricks because God has called us to build a wall of revival. A wall of revival that will impact our lives, our church, and our city. And so we're going to go to the first of the three bricks that God is wanting us, I believe, to pick up in this season. The first of three that we're looking at today, and it's the brick of provision. Turn to somebody and say, pick up the brick of provision. It's a key one when it comes to building this wall. Now, by provision, I'm talking about the provision on the part of God's people for the work of God. We could talk here about giving or generosity. We could talk here about tithing, the giving of the first tenth of our income and of our financial increase to the work of the Lord. Wherever there is spiritual renewal, wherever there is revival, or wherever there is to be spiritual renewal, or wherever there is to be revival, there is always generosity on the part of God's people. And so quite simply, the question is, will we invest in God's revival cause? Will we pick up the brick of provision with our time and with our talents and with our treasure? They wouldn't have been able to rebuild in Nehemiah's day without the people being willing, without the people providing of their time and their talents and even their resources. Nehemiah chapter 8, we spent some time in that in this series. We'll continue to be there today. We saw this beautiful rediscovery of the word of God and the people recommitting to the word. You know, any time we rediscover the Bible, it results in generosity. In fact, in that section in Nehemiah chapter 8, just as they recommit to God's word. And in the midst of their celebration, I love it, verses 10 to 12, you can look at it later, shows that they didn't forget the poor in their midst. Previously, they were doing it. Previously, the rich were even exploiting the poor, taking advantage of them. But as God's word sinks in, it starts to produce a passion in their heart for the needy. And this is the inevitable results of what happens when God's word takes root in our lives and starts to work its way in. And then after their time of repentance, they renew their covenant with God. They reestablish the lines of the covenant. And it's amazing to see how many times and how significant tithes and offerings are in that covenant renewal. Indeed, there are significant sections in the book of Nehemiah about the giving of the people, about the people picking up the brick of provision when it comes to the work of God and the mission of God and the worship of God, of the people providing for the work of God. For instance, at the end of chapter 10, and you can read there between verses 32 to 39, there's quite a long substantial section on giving and tithing. And verse 39 ends with the people saying this, we will not neglect the house of our gods. I believe it was this attitude and this desire that enabled them to see the renewal that they saw. What a commitment. It's the people taking responsibility for the work of God. They're taking responsibility specifically in Nehemiah for the worship of the temple and they are relearning the importance of dedicating the first fruits of their yield to the Lord. 
Now, if you're familiar with the whole story of Nehemiah, and of course we've been encouraging you to read that book throughout this series, then you'll know that the people, they reverted from that commitment for a time. And so in Nehemiah chapter 13, when Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem for a second term as governor, because he went back to Persia for a while, he came back, he sees that because they have started to neglect the house of God, because they failed to bring their tithes and their offerings um, because they've not obeyed the Lord in the way that they had committed. Well, the services at the temple, they've been all but abandoned because the tithes, and that's the reason the tithes had not come in, and the Levites who were meant to serve at the temple, they had been forced to go back to their fields in order to survive. And it led to all kinds of compromise because God's way of doing things, God's system of worship had been all but abandoned and the ministers, the Levites, were not able to carry out the work of God because they didn't have the provision. They weren't able to do what they had been ordained to perform. We read about this in Nehemiah chapter 13 verses 10 to 12. And it says, I also learned, this is Nehemiah talking, that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil into the storerooms. So Nehemiah he rebukes them and he restores the tithe and they respond. It says all Judah. You see, Nehemiah, he recognized that the restoration of the tithe was crucial for the ongoing life of the people and crucial to staying rebuilt as the people of God and crucial to their mission. And Nehemiah chapter 13 shows the link between the people's obedience in picking up the brick of provision and seeing the work of God and his purposes continued and come to pass. Now, the details in Nehemiah, when you read it, may seem remote to us. But the principles still stand. Even when you look at it through a New Testament lens. That God's people are to provide for the work of God. For his ministry in and through the church. And for his mission out there in the world. And so will we like they did, say, we will not neglect the house of God. Will there be a restoration of the tithe? You know, today, I'm not going to be talking about the blessings of tithing that come our way, although there are many. There are many blessings that are talked about as we prioritize God's kingdom cause and put God's purposes first. But what I want to do is appeal to that desire that I know is within every born-again believer to see the gospel spread, to see the work of God move out beyond this building and into our city and into that nation, that desire to see God's glory in our lands and join the link with the restoration of the tithe to that. Would you be faithful with the tithe? Would we see a restoration of the tithe? I thank God for the people here today and over the years who have enabled this church to do what we've been able to do. But imagine how much more we could do when it's not simply a minority of the people, but all the people being faithful and obeying the Lord. So let's pick up the brick of provision because your giving makes a difference. It makes a difference to our worship and it makes a difference to our mission, the mission of God in the world. The next brick that we have to pick up, I believe, that the Lord is highlighting is the brick of praise. Turn to somebody and say, the brick of praise. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, that great chapter where they rediscover the word of God, they gather around God's word, it says this, Ezra Open the book, and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. They bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces 
to the ground. It's praise. It's worship going on. And see how simple it is here. No pomp, no ceremony. I don't even know if there was any music there. It reminds us that praise and worship is not simply music. It's, it includes music. That's a part of that. But it's more than music. It's about a posture of heart, music or no music. That leads to outward expressions. And I love it here because Ezra simply opens the book, the Bible. And the people, they listen intently. And as the word of God is preached, it just spontaneously elicits praise and worship people. They bow down. To, they put their faces to the ground. They shout amen and amen because they are moved by the word of God. And here we find in Nehemiah a great picture of the heart of worship. And it's actually a lesson for preachers and for worship leaders here because true worship involves genuinely hearing the word of God. So often today, people can make it about emotion and about performance. How how well the people perform on the platform. But true worship is about genuinely grabbing hold of the word of God. What preachers and worship leaders and musicians and vocalists exist to do is to help people to genuinely grasp hold of God's word so that it grips their heart and that their understanding of who God is is awakened just as it was there in Nehemiah chapter 8 because that leads to genuine emotion. And that leads to true worship. In fact, the true preaching of God's word should always lead to worship. Nehemiah chapter 8, that simple worship. And then you go to Nehemiah chapter 12. And you see that music is involved. And in fact, Nehemiah chapter 12, it's the dedication of the walls, um, consecrating those walls to the Lord. It's a big, loud musical event. It's a praise party. It's nothing short of that. You see these two choirs, these great choirs, they are walking in opposite directions around the wall. They are filling the city with praise and then they make their way back to the temple. And I love it in verse 43 of chapter 12 where it says, The sounds of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. And as I was preparing this and praying through this message, I just sense that the Lord is saying that there's a new sound and a new anointing coming to City Church worship. Yes, I'm talking about our worship team, but I'm talking about us as the people of God. As we lift up our voices to the Lord, that the sound of our worship can be heard across Cardiff. I'm not talking about audibly. I'm talking in the spiritual realm. That as we gather together and as we lift up our praises to the Lord, Lord, that there will be ramifications in the spiritual realm and that the sound of our rejoicing will be heard far away in Cardiff and in South Wales. Do you believe that? Do you believe that that can happen? I wonder if as a result of the praises here, as we gather the people in our city, we'll hear it and feel it and benefit from it. Our praise can make an impact in the city and show people the great and glorious God that we serve. A new sound coming, a new anointing coming. Yes, our worship team being at the forefront of that, leading us into that. But this is something, a brick that we all need to pick up. I believe that if we want to see revival come, we need to pick up the brick of praise and of worship. Do you know there's something about praise? First of all, it helps us to see God as he really is. It helps us to get God's truth on the inside of us. And the psalm says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Just think about that for a moment. He inhabits. God dwells in the atmosphere of our praises. Where is God? He's everywhere. I'm not talking about now his omnipresence, where he is everywhere. I'm talking about his tangible presence. God inhabits the praises of his people. This means that praise isn't simply, it is, but it isn't simply our response to God's presence. Praise is actually a means through which his presence 
and his power can be encountered and ushered into our lives and into our city. And when God's presence comes, there is freedom and there is deliverance and there is salvation and there is healing and there is transformation. Transformations of lives and transformation of cultures too. When we pick up the brick of praise. In fact, even now, would you just stand with me? And would you lift up your hands to the Lord? And would you just begin to praise him? Let this sound in the spiritual realm begin to be heard even over our city in this moment. A sound of heaven coming from God's people. The sound of praise that breaks chains. I'm not wanting to mix metaphors now. We're talking about building walls, but there are some walls in our city that need to come down. And I think of Joshua and the people there. They saw the walls of Jericho come down as they lifted up their praises to the Lord. As they lifted up their voices, their instruments, as they lifted it up to the Lord with a shout of praise, the walls came down. And so, Lord, I pray that that sounds from this church will reverberate across this city. The sound of your people acknowledging you for who you are. Lord God, acknowledging you as the great gods. Giving you the glory and the honor that you alone deserve. Sing that song to the Lord right now, just where you are. That song to the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 And again, in your own words, honor him now. Adore him. Put him in his rightful place. Pick up the brick of praise, of worship, of adoration. Give him the glory that he alone deserves. Lord, may you inhabit our praises. May you come even now, Lord God. We pray a word of revival over our city, of restoration, of a turning to you, of salvation, Lord God, of miracles, of signs, of wonders, Lord. And let that start with us. May we be conduits of your presence, Lord. Oh, Lord God, inhabit our praises, inhabit our lives, and may we be a people of praise. Our praises touching well beyond our walls. We exalt you, Lord. We exalt you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. So let's pick up the brick of praise. And finally for today, and the final brick in our series, the brick of purity. Turn to somebody and say, pick up the brick of purity. Their joyful celebration in chapter 8 is followed by a time of heartfelt confession in chapter 9. Let's read Nehemiah chapter 9 verses 1 to 3, which says, On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. That's a sign that they were mourning over something. Can you see? They were mourning over their own sinfulness here. It says in verse 2 then that, those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. And we can read that. We think, what's going on here? here? It's so important to just understand the culture and the context there that these people from foreign nations were bringing in idolatrous gods, which was 
corrupting Israel's worship. And that's the heart behind what is being said there. And it says, they stood in their places and they confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshipping the Lord their God. Here we see a picture of separation, of consecration, of purity. It starts by them reading and hearing the words, and that brings conviction, and the people start confessing their sins for three hours. They express this sorrow very vividly, wearing sackcloth and ashes, and then they make this decision to separate. And chapter 9 sees this corporate confession of their sins where they acknowledge what brought them into exile. And they say, on behalf of their past generations, we did wrong. They confess. They identify it. And then they say sorry to God. They repent. They turn around in a different direction. And they recommit to the laws of God. We're talking about building a wall of revival. Any true revival. Just look at the pages of history. It's characterized by a mourning over sin. And it comes, I believe, from a genuine encounter with God. And a genuine encounter with his words. If we want to rebuild the wall of revival... We need to pick up the brick of purity, the brick of holiness, spiritual renewal. And can I tell you something? Desire this spiritual renewal because it's the most amazing thing. Seeing the Spirit of God revive not only your life, but those around you and your city and wider. It involves a confession of sin a repentance on the part of the people of God. True revival is characterized by this deep sorrow over sin. This is why in revival, there's always repentance. There's not people any longer thinking, how close to the line can I get without kind of crossing over? But they're cut to the heart and they consecrate themselves to God. They're not thinking of holiness in a begrudging way. You know, imagine this wedding ring reminds me of my commitment to my wife but you think something's wrong if I'm looking at this ring and thinking oh goodness committed to her now for the rest of my life you think something's wrong because this reminds you of a beautiful thing of a beautiful commitment and one of the devil's greatest successes has been to convince people that holiness is something bad or ugly That it's something that we should begrudge. The Bible talks about the beauty of holiness. And the life transforming power of holiness. But that revival that we long for. Starts with a consecration to God. When Isaiah saw the majesty and the holiness of God. He responded by mourning over his own sin as he saw the glory of God he said woe to me for I am ruined for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the king the lord almighty here in Nehemiah as the word of God is read out to the people as their understanding their eyes begin to open they get the sense of their own sinfulness that's what the word of God should do Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 9, it says, Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people, said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Imagine that. The word of God comes and it cuts them to the heart. Do you know, true, pe- true preaching should make you weep. True preaching should sometimes make you say, Ouch. Why? Because when they finally heard and understood the word of the Lord, they realized how far they were actually from God. How much they were missing out on. They saw themselves in their true condition. And it 
elicited a genuine remorse, which led to a genuine repentance and a turning in obedience to God. I'm not trying to speak about anyone specifically here, but there are too many preachers trying to make people feel comfortable. And there are too many Christians who measure the effectiveness of their church by how comfortable they feel. But we see here, that's not the biblical scorecard. You know, our job as pastors is, and we're certainly not trying to make you feel intentionally uncomfortable, but our job is not to make you feel comfortable. Our job is to prepare you to stand that day before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. To teach you the truth now and to help you make the changes that you may need to make, however painful they may be, to teach you the ways of the Lord now that you will reap the benefits then. You know, we've been reading from Nehemiah chapter 8 and we looked at verse 9. The very next verse, verse 10, is that famous verse which we often say, the joy of the Lord is your strength. But we've just read the context in verse 9. It comes out of a mourning over their own sinfulness. You know, some Christians will never live in that kind of joy because they miss the context. They think of holiness, as I was saying, Satan's biggest success as some kind of drudgery, seriousness, and everything that is boring, instead of knowing about the beauty of holiness and the liberating power of holiness. Because when the Bible teaches about holiness, it also talks about the deep joy and the deep sense of satisfaction that comes from being holy. H-O-L-Y and W-H-O-L-E, whole before the Lord. We need to remember this when we're tempted to give in to the momentary pleasures of sin because sin promises much, but it delivers very little and it robs us. It's like a malignant growth that we're not aware of, but which is ultimately destroying the body from within. And the sooner we diagnose it, the, the better off we are. We see here, the joy of the Lord is our strength. It comes out of that context that we just read in verse 9. Let me summarize it like this. It's holiness that leads to true happiness, to freedom, to joy, and to fulfillment. Why? Because we were created by God and for God. And until we line up with that, we'll always be missing it. Our purpose in life is to live for him and to be consecrated unto him. True joy and happiness in life will not be found in any other thing other than in him and following his ways. And when we live in an unholy way, when we fail to pick up the brick of purity, then we don't access that joy. We're robbing ourselves of the deep and lasting happiness that comes from consecration unto the Lord. The beauty of holiness, the beauty of commitment to our God, the beauty of being dedicated to him. When we pick up the brick of purity, which starts by feeling that great sorrow for our sin. And then when we respond by turning from those sins, that deep sorrow turns into a deep and permanent joy, which nothing can take away. You know, when we take God's word seriously, we'll find that his joy will be our strength. And that's why I believe the brick of purity is so vital to pick up when it comes to spiritual renewal. The church of Jesus Christ, I sense the spirit of the Lord saying this, will not experience the revival that God has said is possible. This is why we exist, to see lives and culture transformed. To see God's revival purposes, knowing that it's not just a thing of our past. It's not just the story of this church's past, but it's the story of our future. God has said it is possible, but the church of Jesus Christ will not experience that revival, that transformation of society, unless she is consecrated to Jesus. 
consecration, confession, revival. We see in Nehemiah as they humble themselves, as they pray, as they seek God's face, as they turn from their wicked ways. I'm borrowing the language of 2 Chronicles 7.14 there. God hears from heaven. He forgives their sin. And he heals the land. There's a rebuilding that takes place. The rebuilding out there depends upon what happens in here. This is so significant. This is so important. I believe the Lord is saying, return to me. Some of us, we've been far off from him. We're stuck in habits and besetting sins. Don't hear judgment today. See the arms of the Father saying, come back. Return to me and I will return to you. The book of Nehemiah is about God returning to his people. It's what Nehemiah wanted to see. Psalm 24, 3 to 4. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He, she, who has clean hands and a pure heart. Friends, it's time to pick up the brick of purity. In fact, it's time to pick up all these bricks. Passion and prayer. Participation. Public gathering. The priority of the word. Picking up the bricks of pioneering. Perseverance and the pursuit of justice. And as we've seen today, the bricks of provision. The bricks of praise. And the bricks of purity. Would you hear what the Lord is saying, I believe, to this church at this time? It's time to rebuild the walls. You know, we're not necessarily going to build back exactly the same way. Often when you rebuild, you take the opportunity to improve. Sometimes to put in the things that should have always been there or because things have changed and you can do something better. We're going to take the opportunity to build back better. We're going to be open to what the Spirit is saying. But the key thing is this, that we roll up our sleeves. We pick up the bricks and we start to build. And as God's people came into alignment with what he, he was saying through Nehemiah, who functioned prophetically, bring the people into line with God's will at that season, we see in Nehemiah an acceleration, a miraculous acceleration to their reconstruction efforts. What should have taken a lot longer, they were able to do in 52 days. There were 52 weeks in 2022. I wonder what would happen. Would we see a similar acceleration? Would it this year not just simply be about recovery, but would it be about advance? Because that's the story of the church of Jesus Christ, that the gates of Hades will not prevail against us but we would advance moving forward it all started with nehemiah catching hold of god's heart with a passion which birthed a burden which led to a nation altering vision which we're still talking about to this day because he caught hold of god's heart our nation lies in spiritual ruins. The walls are broken down. Are we concerned about that? As we start the book of Nehemiah, every time I read it, I get excited because I know that God is about to instigate it. Even when things look bleak, even when it seems not possible, God is about to do something. He's about to rebuild his people. We're about to see a revival take place. Will we see something similar in our day? It started by one man standing up and saying, I'm not going to tolerate things the way they are any longer. Friends, let's not tolerate it. There is so much more. Let's not live in less than God's best. God has said that revival is possible. God has said that there is a future for this church. 
where we can impact multitudes of people and see societal transformation. So this is the time to return to our story as the people of God. City Church Cardiff, this is the time to rise up and rebuild. This is the time to take back ground. This is the time to build back stronger. Would you say, God, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to rebuild. Yeah.